Es freut mich, dass alle so zahlreich erschienen sind heute bei diesem irgendwie auch ein bisschen schwierigen Thema vielleicht, aber auch total unterhaltsam. Und ich, ähm, ich habe was vorbereitet, was wir dann später in der zusammen in der Virtual Reality zusammen erarbeiten. Und ich gebe kurz mal einen Überblick, wie, wie ich selber zu der Virtual Reality gekommen bin. Es äh, gibt es ja erst so seit vier Jahren irgendwie zu kaufen, diese Headsets im Mediamarkt und so weiter. Und, ähm, und zwar ist das erste Projekt, mit dem ich, also ich bin, ich bin ja Künstler, ja. Also falls jemand mich noch nicht kennt, ich, ich mache ja Kunst und ähm, meine Kunst dreht sich jetzt eigentlich seit vier Jahren nur noch um Virtual Reality und Augmented Reality und das ist die Hauptinspiration geworden auch für meine Malerei. Und alles fing an mit einem äh, ziemlich, äh, mit einem völlig aussichtslosen Projekt in der Wüste von Kalifornien, in California City, wo ich ein äh, Rodin's Höllentor updaten wollte. Und zwar sollte dieses Tor zwischen quasi Himmel und Hölle stehen, also auf der Schwelle zwischen zwei Realitäten. Und da habe ich dann ewig rumgemacht, äh, jahrelang, und habe nicht das richtige Medium gefunden, bis dann diese Virtual Reality Brillen auf den Markt kamen. Und dann dachte ich so, das ist es. ja. Ich mal das Portal Rodin's Höllentor quasi in der Virtual Reality. Und äh, das ist dann quasi symbolisch gesehen die andere Seite von diesem Portal, die andere Realität. Und ich platziere das dann mit einer App und GPS äh, auf diesem äh, Ort da in der Wüste. Und dieses Portal sollte dann das Ende der Welt markieren. Und hier, was ihr jetzt hier seht, ist in, in Hamburg, wo ich äh, eingeladen wurde von der Kuratorin, dieses Portal nach Hamburg zu bringen aus Kalifornien. Und dazu habe ich dann äh, eine App gebaut. Und dieses Portal stand am U-Bahnhof Elbbrücken. Das ist auch so ein Sackbahnhof. Und wenn man die App hatte, ups, Und, und wenn man die App hatte, dann hat die diesen Marker erkannt. Und dann kam, dann kam dieses Portal aus dem Boden zu äh, Wagners Eintritt der Götter in Valhalla. Und diese Figuren, die ihr da seht, die sind halt alle, also dieses ganze Tor ist in der Virtual Reality gemalt. Es gibt ein 3D-Malprogramm. Und wenn man jetzt über diese Schwelle tritt, was ich gleich machen werde, dann ist man halt in California City, also in der digitalen Repräsentation quasi. Das sind die originalen Windgeräusche aus der Wüste. Und dann kann man zurückgucken in, die, in unsere Welt. Und da sieht man, äh, diese, das, ist, das ist ein gescheitertes Städteplanungsprojekt in der Wüste mit lauter leeren Straßen. Und man sieht dann, ja, und so konnte man dann halt auf die andere Seite treten quasi. Und äh, dieses ganze Projekt, meine Beschäftigung mit der Augmented Reality, hat dann äh, auch dazu geführt, dass ich in, in dieser Krise, die wir äh, so letztes Jahr hatten oder immer noch haben, also wo es so einen allgemeinen Lockdown gab, dass ich halt plötzlich eingeladen wurde von Museumskuratorinnen, die, die was machen wollten, aber deren Häuser halt zu waren. Und dann äh, haben die mich gefragt, ob ich mir nicht was ausdenken kann, was man im Freien sieht. Und da ist natürlich die App halt super. Ne? Und dann haben wir hier an der Ode Kirk ein, ähm, ein Bring dein Geschäft ins Internet und verkaufe online mit Shopify, der E-Commerce-Plattform, der mehr als eine Million Händler und Händlerinnen auf der und zwar hing da so ein, ein großes Banner vorne. Ode Kirk ist das älteste Gebäude Amsterdams, eine Kirche, und da, aber jetzt eine Kunstinstitution. Und da hing ein großes Bild von mir, ein Ölbild, also ein Druck. Und dann passierte die uh, The Five Minute Apocalypse. So ich und so konnten halt Leute während des Lockdowns sich halt Kunst angucken. Und äh, das sind jetzt auch alles... Äh, in der VR gemalte 
Figuren. Ich nenne die äh, Messengers of the AI. Und im Hintergrund seht ihr lauter Stockfotos von äh, Müttern mit Kindern. Weil es so, es ging mir so darum, diesen, dieses äh, Apokalypse-Thema aufzuspalten in so eine politische Komponente und eine religiöse, weil diese, der Turm der Kirche ist, ist, gehört, der, gehört in der Stadt seit Napoleon und der Rest der Kirche ist halt immer noch in, in, in der Hand der Kirche. Und äh, dann zieht sich dieses Thema der Maria durch diese Arbeit. Und zwar ähm, gibt es die, es gibt die Theorie, dass die Europaflagge inspiriert ist von der, ähm, von der Johannes Offenbarung, weil die Maria so einen Stern von diese ähm, Europa-Gestalt, also ich, äh, ist aus der Serie Artificial Gods, kommt da jetzt halt riesengroß raus zu, ähm, zu Beethovens Neunter, also der EU-Hymne. stürzt dann zu dem Chor auf einen Nieder. Das Ganze dauert halt fünf Minuten, deswegen heißt es nur fünf Minuten der Und was eben dachte ich, dass Menschen wahrscheinlich nicht ähm, länger so ein Handy halten können ne, als fünf Minuten. Weil es ist fünf Minuten ist schon lange. Ne, so, ne. Äh, das ist die App halt ne, auf, dem, auf dem App Store. Äh, die Ausstellung ist jetzt allerdings äh, schon vorbei. Ja, und das ging dann so weiter. Dann gab, war die Galerien waren auch zu. Und, und hier seht ihr halt, wie ich, äh, das ist ein Ölbild von mir. Hier, und dieses Ölbild ist quasi genau dieser Nasenrücken halt. Ne? Und dann kommt diese Figur mit der App halt genau da raus, wo ich den Ausschnitt gemalt habe. Das war in der Galerie in, in Berlin, Bark Gallery. Und ja, hier seht ihr, ups, genau hier, äh, das sind so gro größere Ölbilder und dann mit einem iPad oder mit einem Telefon sieht man dann halt die Augmented Reality, aber es funktioniert nur mit dem Bild. Ja? Also das war so eine Geschäftsidee, dass du halt das Bild kaufen musst, damit die äh, App funktioniert so. Oh no, was ist hier? Genau, und, ähm, und dann das Interessante ist, dass also wenn man in dieser Brille malt, 3D, dann kriegt man natürlich ein 3D-Modell auch raus, ja, weil es ist, ist eine OBJ-Datei oder sonst was. Und das kann man dann logischerweise auch drucken und das habe ich äh, drucken lassen. Oder ich habe ich hab eigentlich selber einen 3D-Drucker im Atelier und ich habe diese, äh, diesen Kopf von einem von diesen Mess Messengers of the AI gedruckt und dann in Bronze gießen lassen. Und das sind so frühere Arbeiten wo ich noch nicht so abstrakt war. Also man sieht noch, ich bin halt immer weiter reingezoomt quasi oder eher die Figuren wurden immer größer, weil in der VR spielt halt Größe keine Rolle. Also du kannst, also es ne, ist egal. Ne? Und ja, und interessant fand ich halt, wie die Veränderung der Leute, wie die sich die Ausstellung angucken, dass sie halt auf einmal das Smartphone brauchen, um, um sich Kunst anzugucken. 
Und das ist halt toll, weil die Infrastruktur gibt es halt. Jeder hat natürlich ein, ein iPhone oder ein Android. Und ja, und lustig fand ich, wie halt hier der, er versucht das halt ähm, abzufotografieren, was er auf dem iPad sieht. <lacht> äh, ja, und dann, da gab es dann noch andere Möglichkeiten für Ausstellungen. Zum, das hier ist eine GPS-basierte Ausstellung in, in, in der Straße, in der Mannsteinstraße 2 äh, vor meinem Projektraum. Depending on Positions, die App ist immer noch da und diese Ausstellung funktioniert dann halt, man sieht die Assets nur, wenn man in dieser Straße ist, ne? weil die halt mit GPS da platziert sind. Und das war, das hat super funktioniert und ich fand es irgendwie total lustig, wie die Leute hier so da durch die Straßen laufen und äh, keiner wusste, was die da machen. Also es war, als würden die so Geister sehen oder irgendwas. Ne? Und äh, die allererste Arbeit, die wo ich diese mit der Virtual Reality versucht habe, das zu visualisieren, weil das ist immer das Problem. Wie visualisiere ich was, was halt nicht da ist, was digital, äh, war mit der HoloLens von Microsoft. Und das war so eine ganze Opa, 20 Minuten hat das gedauert. Und das ging aber auch gut, weil die HoloLens halt viel besser zu tragen ist als so ein Handy oder sowas. Und da kam, das waren dann die... Ähm, also die Ausstellung hieß tatsächlich Messengers of the AI. Das war die erste, die quasi aus dem Portal so herauskam. Und äh, ich kann noch mal kurz zeigen, wie das äh, aussieht, in der, wenn, wenn ich da male. Oh, okay. Oh, schade. Also ich stehe so im Nichts ja? und dann fängt man an, den ersten Strich zu machen. Und so wächst, fängt an, es ist halt ein bisschen schwieriger in 3D zu malen, weil am Anfang denkt man halt, man ist Papier gewöhnt. Ne? Aber dann tritt man auf die Seite und sieht, oh, das ist so, so flach. Ja? Also du musst halt ein Volumen schaffen. Ja, und so also ist halt wie Malerei, es sind irgendwie in Schichten. Und ich mag diese Special Effects, die es da gibt. Es gibt irgendwie einen Lichtpinsel oder einen Disco-Pinsel oder also so völligen Kitsch eigentlich. Ja, und das hat so, das habe ich halt so durchgezogen für die Aufnahme. Es hat so acht Stunden eigentlich gedauert. Ja. definitely do that. I would say that myself as an artist is a little complicated because I tend to see myself first and foremost professionally, which means more of a designer, which I separate from being an artist. I know those two can be integrated into one, but I kind of separate them for myself. And then I say hobbyist because what I do in my hobby time is completely different than what I do for my job and also any jobs that I have had. Um, I would like to get more serious about it, but I'm not sure about that yet. So I'm a little bit interested because we kind of were, we were talking earlier about um, um, the fact that you studied industrial design. And in some way, industrial design is its own creative process. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the connection between your um, kind of expertise in industrial design and art um, and how you see that fitting? So if I'm understanding the question right, how does, are you asking how does industrial design 
tie into art or what are the processes that I'm familiar with and how does that differ? Is it tied to art? Um, I would say product design. So industrial design can be a lot of different things. I'm going to specify into product design um, is generally more problem solving. So you get your area of opportunity and then through a background of human <laughs> ergonomics. So we want to make products for anything you touch and interact with as human designed around humans as possible. And there's a whole design thinking process that comes with it. It's very similar to iterative thinking or like when you do these workshops where you have like all these post-it notes where you blast a whole bunch of ideas out and you filter it down, you put them into categories and you slowly, slowly and very organically find a solution. Um, what something that could tie into art is how product design tends to be iterative. So most people think you make a product and you spit it out. Okay, so I'll get to that. So you, you make a product, you spit it out, and then you think that's it. But oftentimes, let's say this microphone, I make a prototype of this microphone and I'm holding it and testing it. <laughs> um, say like, I have a, maybe it's too top heavy, so it starts to not balance well. Right. Maybe when I hold it, it starts to become very tedious after a while. So we take these things, we take them into consideration and for the next iteration, so the next um, redesign of it, uh, it's better. And we mm -hmm. wanna get, repeat this as much as possible, if possible, to get to a product that I can hold or you can hold where somebody who maybe is disabled can hold for a while. Um, it's kind of a very different from art as I understand. However, um, nothing stops me from, for example, this one. I know I had to do that a few times because the paint didn't go through the screen properly right. and you see it kind of there where the paint didn't go through. And then, so for the next iteration, I can try to think about how do I make that better? That's so interesting that you're bringing that up because before I have you even explain um, some of your, or ask you questions about your pieces, um, we were having this conversation actually yesterday with Samuel Jean about, um, do you, you know, do you make mistakes, you know, in art? Um, and I just thought that his answer was quite interesting. He was like, actually, no way, right? Um, there is actually no mistakes in art. And um, I guess from what you said, I thought it was interesting because it's about making it better every time. Um, and obviously, um, you're a digital artist. Do you think that there is such um, there's such things um, such things as mistakes in art? Um, for me, yes and no, because it depends on how you approach it. So one of my favorite examples of are there mistakes in art was this one time in my very first, so at my university, when you do art, um, you do one year in, in what's called art foundations, where they teach you the foundations of drawing, how to look at something, how to approach an object. And what that came with was design one, but very lightly design one. So when you just start interacting 3D because people always think art is just 2D drawing, whatever. And there was this one time I did a digital piece and I accidentally sent it to the wrong printer. It printed out on film. And uh, I paid a lot of money to print it out on film. And so I brought it to the professor and I was like, hey, I made a mistake. And he's like, no, you didn't. And so he, he took this thing he had this light box, like um, when you trace something, you want to put light underneath, he put it on top and then he put the box on the ground. He's like, look, now it's an interactive piece. Um, now you got to look at it very differently. Like this one mistake turned out to be like something that he was so obsessed with. And I was so no, yes and no. For me um, personally, if I'm doing something like 
the anatomical studies, then yes, I think there are mistakes I can make if I don't perceive something properly. Um, but I think it depends on what the art, the purpose of the art is for. Can you, can you actually tell us a little bit about this piece um, a little bit more intricately? And it, the example that you just gave of mistakes versus no mistakes, um, why that is like that you can't make mistakes. Maybe the hand would look different. I'm not sure because I'm not a digital artist, but if you could talk a little bit more about the process. Yeah, so for my anatomical studies, I think that humans have an inherent understanding of what things are supposed to look like. Of course, um, you could go with like some Renaissance, Renaissance um, paintings where they suggest what it's supposed to be, where they kind of blur, uh, they don't make it very precise, which is great because the human brain gets to fill in the rest of the details. Um, when I do pieces like that, so that was a study where I'm investigating how hands are when you're making gestures, how the tendons come out, how, how does the flesh of the thumb here, the muscle, how does that look when you make a hand like that? So I think for me, uh, I want to make that as accurate as possible. So it's very precise. I didn't blur it, so to speak, but that's just for my own understanding it's actually a like a part of your art to perfect it actually uh, yeah. yeah 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 so but that's really like actually that's a really interesting concept to me because actually before this I was kind of like no you, you, you can't make mistakes in art but it it was really important for you to captivate the hand mm -hmm. in a specific way uh, another example I can talk about from my university days is that my, my school, so the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, has a sister school, the University of Illinois in Chicago. So these are abbreviated <laughs> UIUC and UIC. So uh, these two universities, UIC has a medical program. And what they tend to do is that they send their doctors to our school to learn art, to learn to see. And so when they are eventually doing surgery, they, they've trained their eye to a way through drawing like that to see details and to like understand how to better use your vision in applying to medicine. That's like really interesting, actually. Um, I'm trying not to get stimulated actually by it right now. But um, my question now to you is what makes this or is it because I'm just someone who's looking from the outside? I get the idea that this piece is very different from this one. Mm -hmm. OK, good. <laughs> um, is the process different? And can you talk a little bit about um, the difference in, in your artistic process? Yeah, sure. So that one is pretty easy. Uh, I um, have photographs of hands. And so what I try to do is duplicate it one to one. So this is including um, seeing, not just seeing like the tendons of the hands and stuff, but also training my eye to identify subtle colors of the human skin. So uh, something that I learned like a few years ago was that um, old master painters started painting human, human skins with the first color green. And uh, that's what I was looking for here. So you do see green and orange and blues. So that's, I'm just trying to see those and put it on either exaggerated so I can see better and work with it or like try to be as accurate as possible. For that piece, um, that one goes into the iterative process I told you about, where I sketched it out and I start painting. And uh, I will, sorry, I'm just curious. Can you talk? Because you said I started painting, like, because I just feel like people actually don't know the process, like step by step. So first you sketch it and then you literally paint. Uh, literally in the digital sense, paint? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I do everything, uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about how or like what I use. So I use a digital a tablet, I guess. Um, 
and I draw like I would draw on paper. The only difference is that it's on a screen. It's just not on paper. It's the same thing. There's no shortcuts. There's no magic that happens. Of course, you can cheat and whatnot, but I try to keep it more or less uh, not cheating so I can learn. Um, so I will sketch it out as I would on paper or on a canvas and then like uh, on canvas to like a, a, a base color and start to add details on top and do it layer by layer. So that would be the difference between digital and traditional art is that I can build it in layers and if I don't like a layer, I can delete it. I try not to always do that yeah. because that makes me <laughs> too, like some digital artists fall into the trap of, I can make this really perfect and spend hundreds of hours on it. I try to do steps to not do that, which means I try to keep it to one to three layers and stay there. <laughs> um, so I paint on top and uh, I tried a lot of different faces for that one, actually. So different angles of the head, different whether or not the jaws are open, uh, maybe if how much bone is showing versus how much sinew and muscle. And um, I think for that one, I had seven different iterations that I just painted. Like I would get to almost the end, stop, reflect, be like, hmm, it could be better. And then continue to add or completely delete it and try again. So iterative. But it's totally the brain of a product designer, actually. Like, I personally, that's just because I, just you as an artist and hearing everyone else and how they kind of do their artistic process. Um, now, you, you said sort of, I guess you come back and you were like, I seven faces didn't work. Um, what was the objective? Um, and was it, as I asked, some artists this week was it instinctual or was it emotional like what was the primary objective for the piece at the end that made you say that's the right face I would say for that one specifically it's very instinctual like I there's like a mood I was aiming for maybe a presence or some sort of tone that I was aiming for that I would come close to it's like how you would say if you're acting like you would say a line one way but then there's not enough oomph to it and so you try another way or another way and you you do it again and again until you hit that but you don't really know exactly what you want mm. but you kind of do at the same time and so for this piece what was it that you wanted when you were like the what was the mood that you were uh Okay, so the mood was something maybe a little bit more, I wouldn't say dangerous, mm -hmm. but the promise is there, I guess. Uh, maybe something that looks dangerous, but isn't. So something that you kind of understand, but you kind of don't. Right. So it's a little scary, but is it actually scary? So here in these drawings, you can see the protagonists of the film. These are the queer Aboriginal sister girls who live in the Northern Australian Kiwi Island. Talking about sustainability, they have revived a printing technique with natural colors on natural fabric. The printing of motifs with their ancestral patterns. Right, that's actually quite beautiful. And it's, uh, it's this revival of the ancestral techniques, but on the other hand, have you ever seen drag aboriginals? No. The girls, they have been, until then, experiencing terrible problems, of course, because they have not been recognized by, by the, the tribe, the, by their tribe, because, because, I mean, there is no such category of quite a conservative tribe as queer aboriginals. And until um, recently, they have been experiencing huge troubles as in many different places of our world. Um, until this invention, 
until their invention and until they have created their own so-called TV design center. This right. is what I visited and this is what I filmed and I filmed their story about this emancipatory struggle. Or here, for instance, you can see the drawing of a Shipibo shaman, the shaman who is practicing traditional plant medicine, the traditional herbal medicine in Peru. He is currently here in this drawing being interviewed by Mark John de Brown, who has founded a school in Peru, a school beyond the shaman business where the Occidental epistemologies intertwine with the shamanic practices and this special school is for the orphans. And I'm very inspired by this school because it actually is more, it is an activist project, but it is the school that offers the curriculum of the decolonized world. Or oh, here you can see a drawing of my arms embracing a tree in the pandemic times within the larger down to earth tendencies people have started to use this i have a really good question i, I mean i i feel really fascinated um by the way and we have a zoom question like how do you find these stories actually like <laughs> how do you find these stories to tell it's kind no, of Actually, because of my own background, because what I was interested in is uh, what is the knowledge that is relevant for us today? And of course, of course, um, it is due to my own indigenous background and it's also due to my interest towards the ancient Greece and ancient Greek hymns and ancient Greek mathematics. So I was interested in pre-Socratic forms of knowledge because they are this pre-scientific wisdom, which is so necessary today for our new sustainable world. And I think that we can also... But we have a question, a really quick one, actually, this is from a high school student, I know this young girl, but um, what does indigenous mean? Indigenous is um, a term that emerged due to the um, resistance reaction of the colonized populations of our world. So it is a term that is a response to the colonial aggression which destroys nature and against the exploitation of um, resources. And so indigenous is mainly more or less a term that signifies populations that were there before the colonial powers came. Right, so Native now, Americans are considered indigenous, for example. Sorry? Native Indians, right, in the U.S. are yeah, yeah. There are different just a terms. more tangible Yeah, yeah, example. exactly, exactly. That, right. That's the point. And there are different uh, terms for it in different countries. And, for instance, in, in the case of Greece, there is no such term. Pythagoras wasn't indigenous. <laughs> it was right, indigenous. exactly. That's but uh, you can call this knowledge, you can call this knowledge of unity and, and equilibrium with nature and indigenous knowledge because these were the last populations of our planet that knew how to uh, how to live with the forces of nature, which is the knowledge we forgot, as Bruno Latour claims in the book Down to Earth. And he poses this question in the name of the Western world to the indigenous communities. The question is how they have succeeded, how have they managed to exist and survive? And it's an absurd question because now it seems that those powers that are colonizing those populations are now in the position of asking those populations for an advice. Right. And that's, that's the advice. And the film is the advice. The film collects different forms of knowledge in different parts of our planet of different new rituals of environmental grief, for instance, such as in this case, these girls in India they have invented a new goddess, and this goddess is called Utkasar. Utkasar is a god of plastic in the sea, and they have built a monster goddess out of plastic, and it shows us actually how to overcome and how to deal with the environmental grief with the help of creativity 
as simple as this. Right. Culture. Um, and just out of curiosity, do you feel like that this is like the big, like a big part of your identity as an artist? Yeah, somehow it um, comes up again and again. And I think it's not a surprise that it has come up recently more strongly, also because I live in Athens and Athens is more of an ancient place of um, the global South more than a European country. So a lot of knowledge is still very welcome here. It hasn't been marginalized and it is still very respected compared to the North European forms of knowledge that have been just limited to Hegel and Heidegger. Interesting. So to create a sustainable world, we have to expand our knowledge from the 18th century university to other forms of epistemologies, which I often offer as part of the program of the Autonomy Academia, which I run in Athens. It's actually amazing. I actually see you in the parts of the video. I'm like, ah, oh, there. Um, and um, I'm just, I just want to ask one more thing because I think this was something that was um, kind of interesting. But can you tell us a little bit about this project around feminism that you're working on right now? Yeah, I'm actually in a different meeting right now. Yeah. Um, it's, a collabor <laughs> yeah. it's a collaboration with. Um, with um, something between an NGO, something between uh, a political movement and just a network of uh, activists, which I know since the times of Occupy movement. And it's uh, simply um, a group of people that uh, initiate projects everywhere, mostly in Europe. But we also have one participant from Egypt on our board and um, yeah, different museums, different institutions, different biennials across Europe. And one of the projects is Room to Bloom, which offers space for 100 young <laughs> artists, 100 girls who participate in this uh, series of workshops. And I have been organizing um, a series of workshops on ecofeminism. And ecofeminism related to feminism. I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, it was exactly the mix which I was describing right now. And I'm here in an Athenian villa, which I have rented for these purposes, with a beautiful inner garden. And in this garden, we have been discussing a possibility of environmental personhood, for instance. Our main protagonist is a tree. It's called Araucaria. And we have been practicing mantras. We have been practicing healing techniques and... Our teachers were both from Colombia, from India, That's and uh, also from Belarus, from the peripheries of Europe. And I can see that now you are trying to play the video. Yeah, finally. <laughs> so we're trying to play now, but um, yeah. Enjoy, everyone. Patents on the uses of compounds isolated and synthesized from Campbell. You know, it's a normal price for uh, red tree. Controversial ancestral medicine. I have a problem with the term indigenous. Indigenous people are key to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's not a wellness center. It's a political... She can heal on the highest spiritual level. For people who go to the back, and I'm too much of a hippie. Assimilation of jungle knowledge in the market economy. The term epistemicide is too polemic. The world's most endangered indigenous tribes. Pictures in stunning lifestyle. Form. Celebrated indigenous leader, Rayoni, has said that Bolsonaro is taking advantage of the coronavirus to eliminate indigenous people. The future of humanity. 
depends on listening to indigenous peoples. I dedicate this film to the hundreds of assassinated indigenous climate activists who have fought for their and our living spaces. The victims of this struggle cannot see this film, but they are with us in knowledge. Now, please, take a breath. This is the air for which they gave their lives on the front line. In Australia, Asia, Latin America and Siberia. For us. We live in times when every artwork is screened for politically correct content. Is this why I have a feeling that I have to emphasize my belonging to the indigenous culture of the Mari? Perhaps this is what people call illiberal democracy. If one knows us, the Maris, then it is as the last pagans of Europe. In Russia, they call us the second Chechens. Our highest goddess is called the grandmother of the universe. Our practice of atterir, being down to earth, consists of embracing trees. This is exactly what all indigenous people have in common. They all embrace trees, drink the sun, talk to the plants, worship their ancestors, and have their own bridges to the sky, in order to daydream as I am doing now. All indigenous people have long since read Bruno Latour. Do you remember his fictional conversation with all of us in the down to earth? How have you managed to resist and survive? He asks on behalf of the Western world. It would be good if we too could learn this from you. His question is quietly followed by the muffled, ironic response. Welcome to the club. On behalf of all the indigenous people, I continue to fantasize about Bruno Latour's hallucination. We could, having already gathered unanimously, continue with this answer. It's good that you ask. We need you in order to protect what's left of the environment. Let's first shift your perception of nature from resource extraction for human society to nature as sacred living organism of which humans are only one part. And then we can talk about the third attractor. In pain and conflict, we are overcoming the category of indigeneity which you have constructed and the identity politics you have projected on us. We have long been in the process of hybridizing indigenous science and Western ideas. Here you will meet artists who have stayed in their indigenous communities or who have rediscovered them for themselves and are active beyond the Western art institutions. Masters who have made their outstanding teachings of light as precise as mathematics available to the Western world. Aboriginal cultural workers who emancipated themselves following from the power of their art. Amazonian curanderos who work miracles despite the shaman business. <laughs> but also people who see themselves only as a collective, no longer as individuals, and who realize the latest psychological development with spiritistic ancestor cults. Here, connected in a trans-indigenous assembly, in a daydreamed epistemology dictated by the oracle of plus globalization for a university in times of climate change. 
you can participate in these fantasies, experiences, rituals of environmental grief, down-to-earth techniques and spiritual practices, all of which have emerged as reactions to Gael's rage. What you will see is already the preparation. Can you tell us a bit about your um, journey to the pieces that um, are behind us, actually, which were all collage pieces made by you on a road trip? So maybe the first thing I would love for you to talk a little bit about is your process through the road trip and how you came up with this collage concept. Um, this collage concept, actually, I um, did since 20 five years now almost actually because i couldn't uh, when i was traveling i couldn't do large paintings like i used to do in my studio in berlin or in brandenburg so i had to figure out something first they were actually sketches i thought but then they became an own like art piece and uh, so i did like a lot of them while traveling out of like plastic bags mostly recycled material and um the things I found or people gave to me and uh, I applied them and combined them with little drawings I did in hotel rooms and so, and uh, made art pieces out of it and composed them and tried to uh, like um, compose totally different materials also, uh, which was a concern also in the painting. Um, because uh, when I started using like no oil color anymore, you know, and um, and I started to imply um, things I found or like out of the real life, like car liners and so on. Um, I had to kind of think about material, which is also like material is also like a content by itself. Why do you use this material in painting or in a collage and so on? And a big issue was for me also when um, um, in, in my study years, years of study, a lot of people thought, OK, for the art, you can use all these kind of materials. There has to be like. Um, I say um, uh, all these uh, like, um, resources you used for doing an art piece also at, for big sculptures uh, were not very sustainable. And I thought, okay, why didn't you use like uh, materials you find uh, like society trash and so on, imply them in your work, which is more plausible. You have one st step in reality and you also, um, um, yes, you don't have to like use up new resources. Yeah. Um, maybe it's also because I, um, it's in the history um, that my family um, started this recycling business in Germany in the 1910s in Frankfurt. Yeah. Can you actually, yeah. um, I think this is a really, I was going to say to share this oh. actually, but can you maybe talk about it more in detail? Oh. Because um, one of the things I find incredibly beautiful about Marcus's pieces is that he reuses materials. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, because I'd love for you to also talk more about the farm distillery later and all of the things about it. But for now, please tell us your passion about recycling. Um, my passion, okay, it's not only, this is just one aspect, you know, about this recycling. But um, when I um, wander through, um, like uh, randomly through uh, cities and so, um, I have like um, things which attract me. So it's like also like an image in Chihuahua, like a poster, for example, I have to take a, a um, like a photo of. It's sometimes intuitive. And, and I think also in a big composition that it makes sense in a composition. And since I uh, see myself as a painter, like every motif is kind of like a brush stroke in a painting. So mm -hmm. I always think about how would it look like also in an all over installation. Yeah. So, um, so for example, also like the deepness or the, the contents, which kind of is created by kind of like compose, composing all these different images together to make it a whole, it's also a challenge. Yeah. Um, last year, for example, I was invited uh, to a town called Chihuahua, Mexico and to a gallery. And my idea was that I do like a huge sculpture which is some of uh, which has to be created there. Um, so I took a truck 
and um, select and, and I collected all this material I found on the streets, mostly like from car uh, crashes, like car parts, fenders, and bumpers, and everything I found, and created a five meter sculpture, which still is in the collection there in the gallery. So, and then you have license plates of the area in there. So when people came, so they kind of like had all these references to their their own place. Uh, what I also like that you interact with the place actually where you are and not just kind of bring like a big sculpture from your studio in Brandenburg and just put it there and um, here I'm the artist I'm great no. um, so I feel um, like it sounds a bit like your journey as an artist is more like you're kind of going through this experience and your storytelling through your art do you see it that way um, I'm not really a storyteller it's more like um, I think um, that I absorb somehow the area, how I see it with my own vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody else who would go through there, he would see different things and would combine right. totally different things. But um, I think it's like, because everyone is so unique and has his own vision, how he's brought up, how he, his experiences are. Right. I think, uh, so everybody focuses on different things and I can only speak for myself that I kind of choose those things which I somehow uh, think they're worse to be in an artwork. Right. Um, so one thing actually that I wanted to talk to you a bit about um, is we are a marketing company. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about the connection here. And do you feel like your art has a brand? And if so, did this happen in the first two years? Did it happen in 10 years? Or do you feel like no, I don't have a brand actually yet as an artist. Well, uh, surely every artist has a brand. So like as soon as you sign like painting or drawing with your signature, you have it's a brand. It's like um, yeah, actually something you can sell, right? And this is actually uh, how I also make my living. So and I pay my bills and so on. And, and sure, it's, uh, it's a brand. It's like selling a car or something else. It's like a piece of art you sell. Uh, mm. and, um, but it's kind of uh, the brand is Marcus Sendlinger then. Can I yeah? ask you then a follow-up question behind that? Um, since you did just mm. say that your art is your, basically your brand, your product, do you ever change mm -hmm. your vision through the process because you know you're going to sell the piece? Well, um, actually, I, I know which things sell when I do something somehow over the with experience over the years and which not. And these um, collages and these installations, they're my own private passion to travel and to make a research also about different areas. And um, like, uh, also it gives me a lot of input, but uh, it's not for selling. So I finance these uh, projects, the traveling and, um, and um, the journeys um, all by selling paintings or um, by, uh, by fonda foundations who give me grants for, um, for traveling grants, for example. Yeah. But like, if you know, for example, that um, Michael, let's say, is into collages or this specific kind of painting, do you ever direct yourself to push in this direction does an artist think like a businessman and when do they, right? Because I think that like, this is something we were talking actually about earlier, but like, how can artists begin to also sell their, their art and their product? Well, I would never do this actually. Yeah. <laughs> never really. And I never did it because um, um, I don't think it's, it's a good idea. You have to be true to yourself and authentic and, um, some people certainly do it, but that's their decision. Yeah. And um, sure, um, you always, if you're kind of like in the art market for like 20, 30 years, you somehow can evaluate which works and which not, what not, you know, kind of what kind of like style, what kind of disciplines and whatever. And what kind of, um, there is a certain kind of recipe, certainly, but you never can be sure about it. Uh, but you know also, which is, all the things which are hard to sell, uh, for example, what are you? yeah, for example, when you do projects, you just kind of like are passionate about, like, um, and you make your own research. Um, you don't expect that you sell something from it, so you try to finance it with something else first. Yeah. So you're financing it with mm. like with another painting. Yeah, for example. 
Okay. Yeah. Wow. Actually, that's mm. pretty difficult in my opinion to think mm. about. Okay. Um, yeah, so everyone has his own recipe doing it, right? But that's uh, my way. I did it for the last 25 years. So you're saying you never, ever, ever change your perception in a painting because you want to get it sold? No. <laughs> you promise. I promise totally. <laughs> okay. At this point, actually, we want to just have an open discussion from the crowd. So if you have any questions and comments, just add them and we can we can have yeah go ahead hi Tim, but come to the mic sorry thank you for having me this great evening um just a quick question which is run through my mind at the moment um when when you arrive somewhere or when you are about to begin um do you let um the environment or where you're at immerse you um through the new thoughts or do you already have a sort of goal or sort of target of what you're sort of trying to achieve and you direct yourself to that area? Well, certainly, okay. Um, you have a certain concept for, except for the travel grant, if you apply for one, you have to have a concept. And when it kind of like you plan also to do two or three shows on the road trip, uh, you have to also do it kind of like have a concept for the galleries, for example, uh, somehow, right? Like it doesn't have to really be in the end, really what you do. Um, but um, because my work also is kind of like created in a process. So you have this idea, but you change it while you're doing it uh, because you don't find the right material you actually thought of, you know, the material you kind of you find is way better than actually the, what the plan was. And so um, maybe kind of while you're building it in one or two weeks, um, you change your mind constantly, you know, because, uh, but this is also like, it depends really on the area, what you get and what it kind of like, what you reflect. You know? And uh, then you have to be really like uh, improvising too. And I like improvisation very much you know? because you then don't like it I like it. I like it very much improvisation yeah. because out of this, you know, um, out of things you didn't expect, something really good can be, a new can be really created. You know? Well, you, you can't be organized as an artist, I would say. Well, you have to have kind of an organization, uh, like, um, but you, um, the structure, you have to have a structure, you have to have like an archive, I would say I have an archive of like, of whatever shape repertoire, you can grab on to like your certain kind of shapes you use certain kind of materials you use your experience with. So you don't have to start all over, you know, to testing things and so on. You have to like have one or two weeks to uh, produce something somewhere in another country, somewhere in yeah. another part of the world where you don't know what you get, what you have. And uh, so you try to refer to find like certain things you somehow uh, are experienced with. And uh, through the globalization, I mean, there is a limited uh, possibility anyway, you know, in like, for example, in uh, glue, in, in, in uh, metal, in, like, in certain kind of like things you can attach uh, things to each other and so on. So it, it kind of it doesn't depend when you're somewhere in the Atacama Desert or so in some kind of little shop, they will have some watercolors or some kind of like glue, wood glue or so. You, can, you will also will get somewhere in Brazil or in uh, Mexico or in Germany. So I think everything is made in China anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess the word is, I guess maybe the word is not having expectations instead of organization. You have to not expect that something will turn out or an outcome. Um, yes, I'm totally convinced that there will be a cool art piece coming out of it. So I'm totally convinced that this, this you have to have in yourself that you trust yourself and you know that you kind of like can do something. But this is also like um, the experience you have with material doing this over and over. And also uh, that you use kind of like that you have some kind of aesthetics that you have some kind of shapes in your, in your shape repertoire, in your archive. I would say an archive. So kind of like things you redo somehow and you can trust in yeah uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world see but here's my question then if you don't know what the outcome is how do you know if it will sell or not does that not stick in your head ever well i mean uh, when 
either you kind of restart and do and you save to yourself okay this will be a gallery show with 20 paintings and this will be a selling show or you go out and uh, i will do this road trip i will do two or three wall pieces because you know i want to do them i don't care about selling okay. i finance it in advance in the kind of in a different way but so you know yeah. though that the pieces that are selling you're like you know when you're going to be selling pieces i mean you never can say that you will sell something yeah. but um i think the best thing is still you know to do like oil on canvas and or acrylic on canvas and a certain kind of um, like um, whatever uh, styles or so you know you can oh, you're, you're there you're known for yeah you know? do you think it's because it's easier to sell oil paintings well in germany yes i would say oil paintings 